Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Today, let's take a look at a few highlights in the life of the Iron City Pittsburgh Brewery. Whenever I'm researching for an article, book, lecture, or tour, I always find it to be a great learning experience. Sometimes when researching an event in the life of the Lawrenceville community or of one of the neighborhood's institutions, we encounter misconceptions. In the case of Pittsburgh Brewing Company, there are two misconceptions. The first misconception is that the end of prohibition lifted the country out of the Great Depression and restored it and restored Pittsburgh Brewing to profitability. The second misconception is that until its last days, Pittsburgh Brewing Company was always a very profitable institution. Today, we want to examine some of the periods of financial success in those times when the brewery was financially troubled. I chose the title of the book from the terracotta image above the door of one of the buildings. It is of the Greek goddess Demeter, an appropriate classical motif. Demeter has watched over the buildings since 1886. While today's architecture is very utilitarian, it lacks the aesthetic beauty of some of the past buildings. This is one of the few classical images that may be found in Lawrenceville architecture. In some respects, the brewery was built as a temple to industry. I like to call this next slide, why drink beer? You have to remember that in the early days, drinking water was unsafe. Beer had been around since ancient times. It was relatively cheap, easy to store, and in our early history, even children were given beer to drink. It was only with the advent of safer supplies of drinking water that we see the rise of the temperance movement. One man who helped shape the industry was a German immigrant named Edward Fraunheim. Edward Fraunheim learned his craft as a brewery, brewer by working for the old Bennett's Brewing Company. In 1861, he left the Bennett's Brewing Company, or as some sources anglicized the name and call it the Bennett Brewery, and started his own brewery at 17th Street. It is believed that he was the first brewer in America to craft a golden hue, hue log, lager beer, which he named Iron City. As the business grew, Edward Fraunheim needed capital and manpower to fuel further expansion. His company had various partners between 1866 and 1899. In 1886, in 1866, Iron City Beer moved to a four-story building on 34th and Liberty Avenue. One of the partners of uh, Fraunheim was a man by the name of Leopold Vilsack. During their partnership, Fraunheim and Vilsack had the capacity to produce 50,000 barrels of beer a year, which was a quantity that astonished trade journals of the period. Iron City Brewing Company continued to grow by advertising in various newspapers. One advertisement in a Lawrenceville newspaper called The Clipper in the late 1890s read, Iron City beer is the purest and the most wholesome brewed in the state. The assertion is a broad one, but it is a fact. Being the most wholesome makes it the ideal beer for home consumption. It is pleasant to the taste, tones up the stomach, and makes sickly people strong and robust when used with judgment and regularity. By 1899, the days of the Iron City Brewing Company were over, and a new collaboration known as the Pittsburgh Brewing Company emerged. 21 independent breweries were united with the purpose of producing one standard of purity and excellence, offer the public the best beer, ale, and porter under one general name, and to better the various plants through scientific and mechanical improvements. Of all the plants in the merger, Iron Sea Brewing was the largest with the capacity of producing 400,000 barrels 
of beer, porter, and ale annually. Combined with 13 of the other breweries, the annual capacity was an astonishing 1,500,000 barrels. In the June 2020 issue of Historical Happenings, we carried a story on the great sewer explosion of November 25th, 1913. Pittsburgh Brewing tried to keep their operations going, but on November 28th, 1913, they had to shut down their bottling operations and lay off several hundred workers after a large hole developed in the Sassafras Street side of the building. To prevent further structural damage to the building, the bottling house had to be braced. One of the best sources on the subject of prohibition and corruption in the city of Pittsburgh is Richard Gazarek's Prohibition Pittsburgh. The new prohibition law forced Pittsburgh Brewing Company to abandon the traditional manufacturing of beer, ale, and porter and turn to less lucrative products such as near beer, ice cream, soft drinks, and running a cold storage business. In 1921 alone, sales plunged to $1.8 million and the company posted a record loss of $667,000. To make matters worse, Pittsburgh Brewing remained in the red until 1930. When Mark Davis, master brewer of Pittsburgh Brewing Company, addressed the Lawrenceville Historical Society on September 18, 2003, he noted that the plant had anticipated the end of prohibition with the legalization of beer having an alcohol content of 3.2% in 1933. Since near beer contained either less than one half of 1% or no alcohol, the company filled its vats with near beer, then added the fermenting agents to increase the percentage of alcohol content and had trucks on the street ready to make deliveries at 12.01 a.m. on April 7, 1933. It was estimated that 50,000 people thronged around Pittsburgh's three major breweries waiting for the first cases of legal 3.2 beer to roll through the gates. Before dawn, Pittsburgh's three major breweries shipped a cargo of 3 million bottles and 15,000 barrels of beer to former speakeasies, grocery stores, barber shops, tea rooms, restaurants, and hotels. Maureen Ogle, author of Ambitious Brew, The Story of American Beer, contended that contrary to public beliefs, the repeal of prohibition was not an automatic boom that restored breweries to their 19th century heights. In actuality, the number of breweries continued to decrease from 739 in 1936 to 625 in 1938. She attributed the decrease in part to the drought of 1936 and the recession of 1937, which put additional pressures on the smaller breweries. The shortage of materials resulting from World War II forced brewers to look for cheaper substitutes and ingredients for beer. It appears that through the 1940s, the company did very well. Its beer was extremely popular among blue collar workers, in particular with the steel workers. In 1947, a million dollar expansion and upgrade began. Although there was a general overall increase in beer consumption between 1950 and 1960, Ogle is quick to point out that there were various ups and downs in the market during that period. These downturns negatively impacted the smaller breweries. The 1950s were very good for Pittsburgh Brewing and Iron City Beer became the region's top selling brand. Innovations in the 1960s included the Snap Top Beer Can and the Twist Off Bottle. By 1964, the brewery enjoyed 
17 million dollars in sales. I like to call this next slide corporate beer. The 1960s became the era of corporate beer. During the late 1960s and 1970s, Pittsburgh Brewing Company saw a decline in sales as Anheuser-Busch and Miller aggressively marketed their products into Western Pennsylvania. There was a rebound in the company's financial health in the late 1970s with the introduction of Icy Light, a low calorie beer that appealed to younger drinkers. By 1986, Pittsburgh Brewing Company was ripe for a takeover. In 1985, Pittsburgh Brewing was only operating at 78% capacity. Thus, there were concerns in February 1986 that the facility would be closed after Pittsburgh Brewing agreed to merge with Swan Brewing Company, LTD of Australia. Swan was part of the Bond Corporation Holdings. The corporation was controlled by 49-year-old Alan Bond, a brash financier and yachtsman. Within a few years, it was apparent that the acquisition of Pittsburgh Brewing by Bond only added to the company's precarious financial picture. By 1992, Bond was declared bankrupt and his personal debt totaled $1.8 billion. Apparently, Bond developed a reputation for corrupt dealings and for playing fast and loose with other people's money. He served four years in prison for his shady dealings. The next white knight to take control of RNC Brewing was Michael Carlo. In 1992, Michael P. Carlo entered the scene and made Pittsburgh Brewing a subsidiary of his Pittsburgh Food and Beverage Company. The financial journals were initially receptive of Carlo taking over the Pittsburgh Brewing Company. He was acknowledged as a person who could take failing entities and turn the companies around. Carlo was also involved with the financially troubled D.L. Clark Candy Company and City Pride Bakery. Eventually, Carlo was tried for fraudulent activities of writing checks on accounts funded by bad checks. It's known as check kiting. Once again, Pittsburgh Brewing was in need of a white knight. In 1995, Joseph Piccarilli purchased a brewery for $30 million, or double what Carlo paid for it in 1992. By March 1997, Piccarilli and the union were at odds. Long strikes shut down the brewery following the firing of 109 workers and resulted in the loss of $800,000 in revenues. Production continued to decline. By the mid 1990s, Pittsburgh Brewing was producing only 850,000 barrels of beer or about one half of its peak production levels of the 1950s. Then in, in September, 1996, Boston Beer began to steadily reduce the amount of product that it contracted the Lawrenceville Brewery to produce. Boston Beer reduced its contracting from 400,000 to 300,000 barrels. By 1998, Boston Beer completely severed all ties with Pittsburgh Brewing Company. To add to the Pittsburgh Brewing's woes, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue filed a tax lien against Pittsburgh Brewing in November 1999 for more than $187,000 in unpaid malt beverage taxes. By the end of 1999, Pittsburgh Brewing was only producing 290,000 barrels of beer. Then by July 2000, Pittsburgh Brewing owed approximately $700,000 on their water bill 
and nearly 360,000 on their utility bills. I'd like to compare what Pittsburgh Brewing was doing against Anheuser-Busch. Pittsburgh Brewing was only producing three, 372,000 barrels of beer, while Anheuser-Busch was producing 103 million barrels. So you can see quite a discrepancy there. On December 8th, 2005, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported that the Lawrenceville Brewing Company had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy status in an effort to stop the Water and Sewage Authority from terminating its services. The brewery's financial woes were far, far from over. They owed money into the utility companies, the Water and Sewage Authority, the United States Treasury Department, glass companies, packaging companies, their malt supplier, health insurance companies, as well as to the company that produced their aluminum bottles. Pittsburgh Brewing had a pension plan that had assets of $12 million and liabilities for more than double that amount. They literally were a financial train wreck. By the beginning of June 2007, the long battle for reorganization was finally over, but the battle for financial stability was not. Although the 146-year-old Lawrenceville Brewery was spared closing, it would take another three months before the new owners could take possession of the assets. Milne's group prepared, proposed investing about $4.1 million in, moder in modernizing the facility and paying about $3.9 million to settle with creditors. The purchase of the troubled brewery was not completed until Tuesday, September 18, 2007. Pittsburgh Brewing Company as an entity ended and a new Iron City Brewing Company came into being. The decision by Iron City Brewing to move its production facilities from Lawrenceville to Latrobe, Pennsylvania, ended 148 years of beer manufacturing in the Liberty Avenue facility. Timothy Hickman, president of Iron City Brewing, said that keeping the Lawrenceville facility would have cost between 12 and $15 million to add a new canning line, invest in new ventilation equipment, and upgrade the electrical systems and other infrastructure. RNC Brewing did not reach the 2008 projected goals of between 240,000 and 250,000 barrels of beer. Instead, it only produced 171,000 barrels. On June 22, 2009, Brewing operations were scheduled to begin in Latrobe and bottling would start at City Brewing by mid-July. When it was announced that the property owners wanted to demolish five buildings on track land once occupied by the Iron City Brewing Company, the proposal sparked a fight with local preservationists. In addition to the proposed proposal antagonizing preservationists. The Pittsburgh Water and Sewage Authority, PWSA, filed an objection to the demolition because it held several liens against Iron City and a mortgage on one of the buildings for unpaid bills. The liens were valued at $1.6 million. Preservationists wanted the buildings saved from demolition because of their architectural value and place in the history of our community. Pittsburgh City Council Bill 2010-0311 was passed on July 7, 2010, which recognized Pittsburgh Brewing Company as a historic landmark. Preservationists who spearheaded this fight for the brewery were architect K. 
Keith Cochran and house historian, the late Carol Peterson. On February 3rd, 2012, Tim Shuley of the Pittsburgh Business Times reported that the 8.25 acre complex with 20 buildings had been sold to Collier Development LLC, which was an affiliate of the Collier Development Corporation and was owned and operated by two brothers, James and Jack Cardinani. Sales record indicated that the complex sold for $2.375 million. The new owners were soon at odds with the Lawrenceville stakeholders over the demolition of certain structures. August 15, 2019, Cliff Forrest, president of Rosebud Mining Company, purchased the former Iron City Brewing properties for $5 million. Even before the property was transferred, Forrest began repointing the bricks, replacing the windows, and adding a new slate roof to one of the buildings. He also put new roofs on two of the other structures. The new owner envisioned a brew pub offices and housing on the site. Unfortunately, the COVID virus pandemic of 2020 put many development projects on hold. Before concluding, I'd like to leave you with a thought. Older communities always seem to be in a state of transition. The Lawrenceville section of the city of Pittsburgh is no exception. It would be difficult, if not impossible, for us to track all the many changes since our founding in 1814. With change, oftentimes buildings and historic structures are lost. Furthermore, often with the destruction of those landmarks and institutions, we lose their history. Therefore, it is essential that local historians make every effort possible to document as much of our heritage as they are able. The goddess of grain is hardly a comprehensive examination of the history, heritage, and economic contributions of Iron City, Pittsburgh Brewing. Rather, it's a bird's eye view of a historical landmark and illustrates some of the changes in the business over its nearly 160 years of history. For your kindness in allowing me to make this presentation, I can only say thank you and may God bless all of you.